Benjamin Z. Meller. Welcome to the Benjamin Z. Meller Investor Networking Group. In this meeting, we're going to talk about multifamily real estate investment trusts, REITs, and how those work for investors. We're going to talk about some of the advantages, some of the disadvantages, and some of the special rules surrounding investing in REITs. So today, U.S. REITs are huge. The market capitalization of publicly traded uh, listed REITs is at $1.3 trillion. U.S. REITs, they, they currently own nearly $4.5 trillion of gross real estate with public REITs, $3 trillion in assets, um, and there were $92 billion in dividends that were paid out to shareholders. So the process is investors purchase shares in REITs, the REITs acquire assets, the different multifamily assets. They collect rent. Actually, it's a property management company normally that collects the rent, but that rent goes back to the, to the REITs, and then the REITs do distributions to the shareholders. One of the important metrics with REITs is actually the dividend yield, where uh, you take the current stock price, and in the numerator, you have the annual dividend, and that gives the dividend yield. It's an important metric in REIT investing. Uh, in terms of understanding REITs, there's several things that are important characteristics. They are set up, of course, to generate income. That's the primary purpose. Um, there's different types of REITs. There's REITs that invest in hotels. There's REITs that invest in warehouses, office buildings and apartment buildings. One advantage that exists of publicly traded REITs is the fact that, that it is a very liquid asset. So it's easy to get your money out of it where you can just get on your brokerage account and push sell. But there's a lot of downsides that we'll talk about later. But that's the one that makes it attractive for many people is that they can get their money back quickly if they're in a publicly traded REIT. Uh, they, they use professional management and, um, you know, they're, they're part of a diversified portfolio. They can be something where if you've got some different assets, some investors like to have some REITs in their portfolio. Uh, they provide dividend income, uh, but there's some very specific rules that relate to REITs. So they're, the, to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about the Internal Revenue Code because there's some very specific criteria in order to be recognized as a REIT. Uh, the first criteria is, according to the Internal Revenue Code, at least 75% of the REIT's gross income has to come from rents. So the gross income generated by the REIT can't come from things like flipping properties. The, in order to maintain the status as a REIT, it has to be seven, at least 75% of the income is coming from rent uh, income. And at least 95 of the REIT's gross income must come from real estate sources. So they can't invest in cryptocurrency or something like that. They've got to, the income has to come from, uh, from real estate sources. Uh, so 75% <clears throat> of the REIT's total assets have to be in real estate or real estate related assets and they have to distribute and this is a key point u.s reits have to distribute 90 percent of the taxable income to shareholders in the form of dividends and they've got to have at least a hundred shareholders and no more than 50 percent of the shares held by five or fewer individuals or entities they call this the 550 rule so the sec also regulates reits uh the irs is concerned with the tax aspect and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. They're, they're looking at the actual offering and there's certain regulations. For example, they have to file an annual report, a 10K, a quarterly report, a 10Q. These things are required according to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commissions. And then there's also state regulations. So we're talking about federal regulations now, but there's also state regulations depending on where the REIT is registered. There can sometimes be state level regulations. 
They will have different asset and income tests, annual audits, where an independent certified public accountant will do an audit. And then the main thing is full disclosure. That's something that's a key aspect of the REITs. There's a board of directors and trustees, and they have to maintain compliance with all of these requirements. It's important. Um, a lot of times people hear about tax advantages with REITs and there seems to be a point of confusion there that we'll go over on how that works. But, uh, the, there are tax advantages, but there's also not tax advantages and we'll discuss that. So uh, REITs are exempt from federal income tax at the corporate level. So underline that part at the corporate level. So that doesn't mean that if you're receiving distributions from, from REITs that you are not going to have to pay tax on your dividends. Uh, that is something that they definitely are going to be taxed. Uh, this tax structure makes REITs an attractive option for some income seeking investors, but the, it, here's some examples of multifamily REIT investments. There's, these are some large companies, equity, residential, Independence Realty Trust, and they offer liquidity, passive income, and professional management. They have a stock symbol that you can see there. There's different types of REITs, equity REITs, and these are examples here of equity REITs. But another category of REIT is mortgage REITs, and they actually are involved in the financing of the acquisition of, uh, of real estate. Uh, there's mortgage-backed securities, and we'll give an example of that a little later. And then there's mortgage loan origination, mortgage loan acquisition. Here's an example of mortgage-backed securities. This is actually with the company Fannie Mae. And we're looking at a prospectus, a multifamily mortgage-backed security prospectus for Fannie Mae. And you can see here, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the things that are contained within that prospectus. But mortgage REITs, they invest in mortgage-backed securities. And here's an example of a mortgage-backed security. This is with Fannie Mae, but there's a lot of other types of mortgage-backed securities. And the primary source of income on mortgage REITs is uh, interest and principal payments. There, there's a lot of factors that are also important risk factors with REITs, including the interest rate risk. There's also prepayment risk, because at any time it could be paid back early in most cases. Um, mortgage REITs, they're involved in a lot of different things, but there's, there's two main categories of REITs in general, and those are public and private REITs. So, you know, there's the private REITs that work the same as the public REITs, but the difference is, you know, you give up the liquidity. So public multifamily REITs, they offer high liquidity. Uh, with the shares traded on stock exchanges, while private multifamily REITs have far lower liquidity, limited exit options, and less transparent pricing. So that's a big downside of private REITs. But public multifamily REITs, a lot of people get attracted to that just because of the lure of being able to get your money back quickly, but you're going to pay a significant price for that if you purchase one of these. Private multifamily REITs, they're illiquid. Now let's do a comparison that is an interesting comparison. And we'll talk about uh, looking at private REITs versus what many people think of as a much better alternative to public and private REITs, and that is multifamily limited partnerships and syndication. So with a private REIT, the investors, they purchase shares and then they sit back. With a multifamily, the, there's a general partner and then there are limited partners. And the limited partners are the ones that get the preferred rates of return and don't have to do any work. There's regulation, both private REITs and multifamily syndications are subject to regulation. They both have low liquidity. Uh, private REITs might be a little bit more liquid, but not always. Uh, they the, the private REITs can sometimes have a little more diversification, uh, but you can simulate diversification by investing in more than one syndicate. So the minimum investments, uh, these are, you know, sometimes they are lower minimum investments, but 
in the multifamily, it's typically higher minimum investments. Uh, the management in both cases is uh, professional. You normally have in a syndication a general partner that has experience with multifamily. Um, and then the profit sharing profits are distributed to the shareholders with a private REIT and then the properties are distributed to the investors in a syndication based on whatever the partnership agreement term about the main downside of REITs and this is something that is so so important if you're about to purchase one of these look at the amount of tax that you are going to pay on your REIT so the corporation pays no tax that you know that's uh, that's correct but that doesn't mean that you as a REIT investor pay no tax you're going to you're going to be up to a top tax rate of look at that 39.4 39.6% so if you get 100,000 in dividends you're going to pay 40,000 in taxes if you've got 10,000 in dividends you're going to pay 4,000 in taxes that is significant and that's something to think about. That's a big, big downside. That's a tremendous downside. And the other thing is uh, when you are investing in as a limited partner, which in many cases is so much better. And if you're interested in that, just send me an email to ben at benjaminzmiller.com. I've got some more information I can share with you. But this is something that's important. You know, if you're looking at REITs, you need to be familiar with a couple of things. There's uh, funds from operations and basically the calculation, if you're trying to calculate this key financial metric, is you're going to take the net income, you're going to add the depreciation, and you're going to subtract the gains on the property sales. So imagine that uh, a REIT has a net income of $10 million. Okay, so we put in $10 million there. $5 million in... Uh, and then we're going to add five million for depreciation, and then <clears throat> we would look at the gain on the property sale of two million. That would give a funds from operation of thirteen million. The, another key metric with REITs is the adjusted funds from operations, and that's calculated by you take the first you're going to calculate the funds from operations, which we just did here, where you use this formula, the net income plus the depreciation minus the gains on property sales. You're going to plug in that number, which was $13 million in the last example, and then you're going to subtract capital expenditures, and then you're going to add in any one-time expenses. And the significance of it is it helps investors to understand how much cash a REIT can distribute to shareholders after accounting for necessary property maintenance and other expenses. So you go through all of that calculation and you're going to come up with a, an, you know, a bit of an idea. And then, of course, there's net operating income. That's, a, that's always important. That's a relatively simple one. You just take the total rental income and subtract the operating expenses. Um, this, the operating expenses are things like property management fees, property taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, repair, landscaping, lots of different things. But it's an important metric and it's used all over in multifamily investing. In general, assets that have lower cap rates tend to be higher quality assets and assets with uh, higher cap rates generally are riskier assets. Um, but that is you know, the, that is something that's important. <clears throat> so in conclusion, if you're looking at REITs and you're thinking about REITs, it is advisable to shift your focus or at least to learn more about limited partnership interests before you just jump on the computer and buy a REIT because you found a stock symbol and, well, it was easy. You may be costing yourself a lot of money if you take the easy route. Wouldn't it make sense to explore what's available? Just send me an email, ben at benjaminzmiller.com, and I can provide you with significantly more information. Uh, you know, limited or partnership opportunities with experienced sponsors rather than REITs, in most cases, it makes a lot more sense. And it's important to get properly educated about all of this to know what you're investing in. I hope that helps, and I wish you good luck with your investing.